Hi, I am here to talk about education. And my big idea is that we can dramatically improve education if we correct a dangerous misunderstanding we have about the key technology at education's core, how teaching works. So I'm gonna walk you through a simulation of how we misunderstand teaching. We're gonna do three problems together. Here is the first. Who here can tell me the answer? What is 49 times five? Just shout it out. Okay, it's not like the dress, we're all in agreement. And you're right, the answer is 245. Now, are you ready for problem number two? Why would a child think that 49 times five is 405? Any ideas? A little bit harder, so while you're thinking, I'm gonna go to the third problem. Which of the following two people is most likely to know the answer to the previous problem I showed you? <laughs> Option A is a decorated mathematician. His name is Hyman Bass. He's a professor emeritus at Columbia University, where his accomplishments earned him the National Medal of Science for his contributions to mathematics. Some of those include inventing an entirely new field of algebra. Algebraic K-theory is what it's called. I didn't know that algebra had theories A through J, but he invented K. So he is option A. Option B is Deborah Ball. She is best known for her work teaching elementary school to third graders at the Spartan Village School in East Lansing, Michigan. There, her accomplishments include entrepreneurially identifying an abandoned stove on the street by her school, dragging it into her classroom, hooking it up, and using it to teach her students math through baking. So, which of these two people do you think is most likely to know the answer to this problem? You can vote with your applause. Who votes for Hyman Bass? Who votes for Deborah Ball? Excellent. And indeed, you're right. When many questions like this were given to two groups of people, the first accomplished mathematicians and the second accomplished elementary school math teachers, to the mathematician's horror, the elementary school math teachers outperform them every time. The key takeaway is that it is not enough to know a subject well to teach it. Teaching instead requires specialized knowledge and skill. It requires understanding how students are likely to misunderstand a problem, to know why they're making the wrong answer and what that wrong answer will be, and then to diagnose the underlying misunderstanding that causes it and figure out what to do to change that. So teaching requires specialized knowledge and skill, but as a country, we have not treated teaching that way. So one example, this is a teacher, Stephen Farr, who is emblematic of many teachers across the country and in this city and state as well. When he first entered the teaching profession, he was assigned a mentor. And that mentor told him that by law, she was required to observe him teaching. But she said she was so sorry to have to do this because she said, teaching is the second most private act. You do not want to get caught having someone else watch you do it. So we do not treat teaching like it requires specialized knowledge and skill. We treat it like Victorian era sex. We treat it, <laughs> in other words, in a way that leaves teachers isolated in the classroom. They are alone, John Dewey said, so that the greatest ideas they have are born and die with them left completely alone to tackle this incredibly complex work of helping students learn academic subjects. What are the consequences of this? We know the test score results, we know where we stand in international rankings, but the most important consequence is perhaps summarized by a story from the 1980s. In the 1980s, the A&W restaurant chain decided that it would compete with McDonald's. And it had a foolproof plan for how to do this. They were going to compete with the crown jewel of McDonald's, the Quarter Pounder. They were going to release the A&W 
third pounder. Not only would it be a bigger burger, a third versus a quarter, it would be tastier. And indeed, when they did taste tests, customers agreed the A&W third pounder was tastier than the McDonald's quarter pounder. Not only would this burger be bigger and better, but it would be all of these things for the same price. The same price. Who wouldn't buy this burger? And yet, after introducing it to the market and rolling out a lavish marketing campaign, nobody bought it. And A&W was stumped. How could this be? Why would this be? Until they held customer focus groups. And customers after customer said the same thing. They said, why should we pay the same amount that we do <laughs> at McDonald's for your third pounder? They thought that because three is smaller than four, a third pounder must be smaller than a quarter pounder, and they were not going to be cheated. <laughs> so what do we do about this? We have a nation that is built on a premise about teaching that is wrong, and as a result, we are all walking around knowing less than we could, empowered less by our educations. So what could be different? Another country does this very differently. That country is Japan. Japan does not treat teaching like a private act. It treats it like a public good. This is an example of one of the many lessons I saw in Japan where the teacher and her students were not left alone to do the difficult work of teaching. Instead, they were surrounded by observers. It was a public lesson. This one is a small example about 10 to 12 people surrounding the rim of the perimeter of the classroom and taking photos of the students at work. In some cases, teachers will teach on a stage like this in front of an audience even bigger than this. Sometimes a thousand teachers will come from all across the country to watch other teachers teach. Teaching in Japan is a public good. And then when after they teach in public, Everyone gets together, like we will do later today, to discuss what we just saw. And they unpack the different teaching moves that were successful and unsuccessful. What did the teacher do? And what did the students learn? They have big discussions about this. And through this process, innovation happens. Two examples of what that can look like. The first, this is a chalkboard that is representative of many chalkboards I saw in Japan. Um, in Japan, because teaching is treated like a science, like something to be studied and learned over the course of time, a whole vocabulary has emerged to talk about the detailed technical work of teaching and learning for which there are no English translations. One of these words is bansho. It means the science of blackboard writing. How does the teacher write on the blackboard to ensure that students will learn? A tiny example of innovation in the field of Bansho is on this board. You can see there are tiny little blue and pink rectangles. Those are magnets on which are printed every student in the class's name. How did this idea emerge? One teacher was solving a small Bansho problem. In Japan, teachers often take a great idea from the class and put it on the board, and they identify it through the name of the student who had the idea. That way you don't have to say, that whole thing about A&W and the quarter pounder and fractions that Elizabeth shared, you can just say, Elizabeth's idea. So they will find themselves often writing students' ideas on the board and a small inefficiency emerges. They are often writing students' names over and over again. One teacher decided why not pre-print the names on magnets, take the name, attach it to the idea when it comes up. Quick time saver. Not only that, because the lesson was public, her colleagues saw that there were other great things added too by creating these name magnets. First of all, in order to start the class, all the names would be on the right side of the chalkboard, every student's name, meaning that every time a student participated, the whole class could see who had participated. It was a simple tool for holding the whole group accountable for the goal of multiple students contributing. So one teacher has this idea, other teachers see her use it, they refine it. By the time I traveled to Japan a few years ago, the name magnets were everywhere. This is how innovation works in education. 
Another example, the problem of teaching subtraction with regrouping. What is subtraction with regrouping? It's those annoying problems where instead of something simple, like 16 minus 2, you have something hard, like 12 minus 6. The 6 is bigger than the 2. Your mind gets confused. Students need to learn this. Well, these are all of the possible problems a teacher could use to introduce the concept of subtraction with regrouping. In our country, each teacher needs to confront this problem alone. What is the most efficient problem to use to introduce the idea? In Japan, through the act of treating teaching as a public good and developing an emerging science of teaching, they have identified the single most effective problem to introduce subtraction with regrouping. It's 13 minus 9, and now four out of five major textbooks in Japan use that problem. No teacher needs to figure this out after 10 years on her own. It is baked into the knowledge of the system. So what would it look like to build these kinds of conditions in our country? I want to tell you the story of Magdalene Lampert. She committed her career to helping children learn and then helping more teachers help them learn well to spreading great teaching. But she, and she did everything she could. She worked in schools, she became a university professor, but midway through her career, she came, became very disheartened. She thought, maybe it's just the fate of our country that great teaching will still, as John Dewey said, be, live and die in the single teacher. It will never exist at scale. She was so disheartened that she does, did what any depressed university professor does. She signed up for a sabbatical. <laughs> she decided to go to Italy, and her plan was to drink wine, learn Italian, and not think at all about education. And she did that. She went on the internet. She found a great course called Italia Idea, a whole school dedicated to helping adults learn Italian, and she signed up. She shows up, and there she is one day in class when something Remarkable happens. The teacher had introduced the activity. The students were working on the activity when about five minutes through class, the teacher steps out of the room. A minute later, he comes back with a new activity, and their work continues. Now, I'm a journalist. I'm not a great teacher. If I had been sitting in this class, probably wouldn't have noticed that anything special was happening. But Magdalene Lampert is an excellent teacher. And she knows a fellow excellent teacher when she sees one. She knew that this teacher was doing something very special. He had studied the student's work on the activity he first assigned, and he had diagnosed an underlying misunderstanding that was common to all of them. They were all struggling with subject-verb agreement. But the, the task he had assigned them had nothing to do with subject-verb agreement. So he left and got a task that would help them deal with their underlying misunderstanding. The way this Italian school worked, students got a new teacher every three or four weeks. So three or four weeks later, Magdalene and her classmates get another new teacher. And with this teacher, it's the same thing. Another great teacher. The next teacher is also great, and the next, and the next. It's something unlike Magdalene has ever seen great teaching at scale. And she has to figure out how this could be, what made this possible, this thing that she didn't believe could ever exist. So she abandons her sabbatical and turns it into a research project. Here is her conclusion. She concludes that what is at work at Italia Idea is something called infrastructure. What is infrastructure? In transportation, infrastructure is all the invisible stuff that makes it possible for people and things to move across space and time in a reasonably reliable fashion. So yesterday, I was at home in Brooklyn. Today, here I am in snowy Dallas. And tomorrow, God willing, I'll be back in New York. What makes this happen? It's bridges, roads, speed limits, FAA regulation, pilot training, thank God. All of these things conspire to make something amazing happen every single time. In education at Italia Idea, something similar was at work. So the core enterprise was the same as we have in schools here. There were three ingredients. Teachers, 
students and the stuff that they needed to learn. But instead of leaving teachers and students on their own to solve that problem of how to combine the three ingredients into the magic of learning, at Italia Idea, teachers were surrounded by an invisible infrastructure that made it possible for them to do great work every single time. What were some of those ingredients? One, material and technical resources. So why was the teacher able to step away for just a minute and come back with a completely finished activity? Because the school had a lesson bank, a simple place where teachers added their lessons that they had created in response to the problems that students were struggling with. So one teacher created it, all teachers had access to it. What else was at work? Induction, teacher education, and professional development. There, it turned out, Magdalene learned in her research, that an entire institution existed for the sole purpose of training teachers to work at Italia Idea, an entire school. And unlike most teacher education programs in this country, this program was focused on the science of teaching. That was its whole business. They practiced, they rehearsed, and they did the equivalent of studying problems like, why would a child think that 49 times 5 equals 405. So when they encountered mistakes, they knew already why those mistakes would happen. Finally, what else was at work? The organization of teachers' time, the organization of their work. In this country, teachers spend an average of 1,000 hours a year teaching in front of students. In countries that outperform us, it's almost half that, under 600 hours. That means that those countries have 400 plus hours in which teachers' job is to study students' learning, study how to teach, go watch a colleague do a great lesson, to learn. In this country, we expect teachers to do that when they should be having dinner with their families. And that was true at Italia Idea as well. They could create a lesson bank because they were paid to do it. Learning was baked into the structure of their job. So I bring up this idea of infrastructure because our education debate has become completely fractured around a misunderstanding of teaching. If we're really going to put the ideas forward that will move our cities to be better educated, we need to embrace the complexity that teaching requires specialized knowledge and skill. And then we need to build all of these pieces here in Dallas so that every single teacher can be great and every single student can have a great education. Thank you.